Hi everyone, I'm Travis and I'm going to tell you all about our work on verifying storage systems. So first, uh, what do I mean by verification? Well, the object is to have a program and a proof of its correctness so we can be confident doesn't, that it doesn't have any bugs. So just a si simple example of what I mean, let's suppose we're implementing some kind of key value dictionary. So this implementation is going to have some sort of data structure, probably like a binary tree or a hash table or something like that. And there's going to be all this code. It's going to handle all these edge cases like, you know, what if there's an empty tree versus a non-empty tree and so on. And the implementation will probably, you know, span hundreds of thousands of lines of code. And so we want to be really confident that this implementation is correct. And so in verification, we'll construct some kind of specification of how we want it to act. And so we can make our specification very precise. We can state it mathematically like the specification here or in terms of a mathematical function um, that explains what exactly we want a uh, key value dictionary to do. And then we construct some kind of proof that our implementation actually matches this abstract behavior. And we're going to have this proof checked by a computer so we can be extremely confident that it's correct. So that's what verification is. Now, let's talk about persistent storage systems. Um, when we're dealing with storage systems, we have a lot more things to consider. For one, we have some disks that we're storing our data to. Um, and we're going to have some interface to that disk, which we'll probably want to be using asynchronously for efficiency. We're going to want to use some kind of IO efficient data structure. Um, our implementation is probably going to have some kind of caching, some kind of eviction policy, all, all things like that. Um, we're going to have to write our implementation very carefully for crash safety so that uh, data doesn't become corrupt when uh, there's a sudden power failure, for example. And uh, finally, we need to be CPU efficient. Um, even though IO efficiency is sort of the dominant term, we can't neglect CPU efficiency. And once we're dealing with all these complexities, uh, we're certainly going to be into the thousands of lines of code territory now. Um, so there's quite a lot to get right, um, lots of you know hard edge cases to consider, and so this is this is the kind of situation where we really want to have verification. And so, again, when we verify, we're going to have some kind of specification. Um, it's going to be a little more complicated now because uh, the specification needs to expose a way for the user to confirm data has been persisted. It's going to have to have some kind of guarantee about how data is persisted across a crash. Um, but still, it's going to be much simpler than the behemoth on the left. So by doing this verification and constructing this proof, we can be much more confident that our persistent uh, storage system is, is correct and crash safe. So this is what we want. And now what we did is we created very better KV. Um, this is a verified storage system. It's crash safe and it's built on the uh, B epsilon tree, which is a uh, IO efficient write optimized data structure. Uh, the system is written in the verification language called Daphne. And um, in creating the system, uh, we've done a few things. One, we've identified a general methodology for verifying asynchronous systems like our disk system. And two, uh, we've uh, used linear types and combined them with Daphne in order to improve the experience of verifying efficient imperative code. And I'm going to tell you about both of those things today. So for this methodology, what we really need is a clean and flexible way to encode the environmental assumptions. What I mean by that is, for example, how does the disk work? How does the disk's asynchronous nature work? And what kind of failure scenarios are being considered? And so, the problem of encoding environmental assumptions is actually a pretty general problem across asynchronous systems. Um, for example, Iron Fleet, a verification work from 2015, um, has to model asynchronous network distributed systems, and it uses state machines to do so. And so what we're going to do is we're going to generalize and apply the same methodology to storage systems. Um, and this is great because it shows that there's no need for a domain specific logic to encode all of the environmental assumptions. So I'll briefly quickly explain how um, Ironfleet works. So in Ironfleet, they 
uh, represent a distributed system as a state machine with a bunch of host machines connected by a network. Now, in order to define the state machine, they first declare a smaller state machine called the host state machine. And then the allowable transitions of the host state machine give rise to the allowable transitions of the network system state machine. And these host transitions could possibly be associated with some network operations, for example, sending a packet to another machine. And uh, such a transition would correspond to adding this packet you know, into the network so that it could be delivered to another host in another transition later. Now, to sum that up, uh, basically it's this templated state machine network system defined in terms of a smaller host state machine. Um, and the important thing is that this state machine definitions encodes all the environmental assumptions we care about. Um, it encodes how packet delivery works, it encodes packet reordering, packet duplication, uh, packet loss, us, uh, and so on, all those things. And so what we demonstrate is that we can use the same approach for other asynchronous systems like our disk system. Now let's talk about what we want this disk system state machine to look like in a similar vein. Um, this time we'd only have one host, although in principle we could have more. Uh, but crucially what we have now is a disk. Um, again, you know, the transitions of the host state machine will give rise to transitions of the system state machine. Um, and again, the host might be doing some, you know, interaction with the environment, like sending a command to the disk, uh, which would correspond to putting that command out onto the bus between the host and the disk. Uh, however, now we need more transitions that correspond to the disk's operation. Um, so for example, we might have an, a transition where the disk uh, accepts a read command and then returns a block of data back to the host, uh, which the host could receive later. Um, and crucially, we also now have a crash and reboot step, which simulates uh, some kind of like power failure, for example, uh, where you know basically data persists on the disk, but uh, the host is uh, rebooted and returns to the initial state of the host state machine. So just to put it side by side, you know you have the network system which deals with delivering packets, uh, reordering, and duplication, and then you have uh, the disk system which is sort of like a two node distributed system, but a lot of the details are different. Um, for example, uh, we're not gonna have like commands duplicated anymore between the host and the disk, although write requests can still be reordered. Um, now we're not just dealing with host failure, uh, but also host reinitialization. So we can talk about uh, persistence and recovery procedures. And uh, finally, uh, you know, we also, this model also supports a limited uh, form of spontaneous data corruption, uh, which uh, the implementation has to defend against using checksums. So um, to sum all that up, our uh, method is to encode all the environmental assumptions in the definition of this templated state machine uh, system. Um, so this is a natural extension of Ironfleet's method and it provides a clean split between the environmental assumptions um, in the system state machine and the implementation details in the host state machine. Um, and this means the environmental assumptions are easy to read and understand. So one can easily figure out like what, uh, what, the, what kind of assumptions the system is making about the environment. Now let's take a step back and recall that our goal is to have this abstract specification and a proof that our implementation meets the specification. So how do we get all the way to that? Well, now that we've constructed a system state machine, which represents the behavior of our system, um, we can think about designing the application specification also as a state machine. So for example, with the key value store, our transitions might be uh, correspond to inserts and queries and so on. And then we're going to show a correspondence between these called a state machine refinement and have it have a mechanically verified proof of the refinement. Um, and a big part of our work is, is organizing and modularizing this proof, uh, but I'm not gonna go into that for this talk. Um, instead, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus down at the bottom of this picture where we have our host state machine. Now, this is a pretty complicated state machine. It, you know, for very better KB, it's gonna have B epsilon tree logic, caching logic, even journal logic. However, it's still just an abstract state machine. 
So the final step is to actually make an implementation with actual compilable runnable code. Um, and then, you know, verify that the implementation implements the state machine. And at this point in the stack, we've, you know, sort of removed the environment from consideration. So uh, we can use very well-established traditional verification methods for this part, like void hor logic. Our goal then is to have efficient runnable code that implements the state machine and verify that code. Um, and generally having efficient code means that we're gonna be wanting to write imperative code um, with mutable data structures that we update in place. So let's take a sec to look at why this is hard. Now, Daphne at least uses a memory using strategy called dynamic frames. And one great thing about dynamic frames is that it's very flexible. However, um, the cost is that, is that it requires a lot of explicit aliasing information. So as a simple example, suppose we have this point class and a method called foo, which takes in two points a and b. First, it sets a.x to be one, then it modifies b.x, and then it has an assertion that a.x is equal to one. An assertion is essentially an annotation to the verifier that it should try to statically check that this statement will always hold at this point in the program. And it certainly looks like this is true. We just set a.x to be one, and then we look, and then in between we performed this operation that looks unrelated. However, Daphne will be unable to prove this assertion. And if we think about why that is, it's because um, you know A and B might have been the same point to begin with, in which case modifying B um, will in turn also be modifying A. Um, one thing we can do to fix this is to add a precondition that A and B are pointing to different objects. Um, and if we do that, Daphne will be able to prove this assertion quite easily, although it would have to um, reject this call, which would now be illegal. Um, now, this doesn't sound so bad. Um, however, the thing to consider is that um, pairwise conditions like these will grow quadratically as the number of objects grows. And also, once we start handling deeper data structures like trees, we'll have to start talking about sets of objects. And so, in practice, the aliasing conditions look less like this and more like this, which is referenced maybe 100 times in our code base, or it'll look like this, or it'll look like this. So it's very cumbersome. Um, and one thing we could do about this is we could try to write immutable code instead. Uh, here, we don't modify A and B directly. Um, instead, the, the A and B are immutable data types now. Um, and uh, we're simply creating new objects rather than modifying the existing ones. And so now the verification is much easier. Um, a prime can't possibly be modified, so the verified doesn't even have to consider that. Um, but now copying objects is much slower, uh, especially when we're dealing with large sequences. We can't just be copying these large sequences around for the sake of writing immutable code that's easier to verify. So what if we could verify objects as if they were immutable, but have the compiler generate code with in-place updates? And it turns out we can do this with a linear type system to enforce exclusive ownership. Uh, so for example, um, here's that same code from the last slide, but now we've added the linear keyword. So again, we're treating objects as immutable, or the verifier is, so it can prove this assertion very easily. Um, how, However, uh, it would re still reject a line like this because um, in a linear type system, uh, a variable can only be used once. And so using a twice like this would be illegal. So the linear type system is enforcing exclusive ownership. And whenever you have a variable that can the only, whenever you have a linear variable, it is the only variable pointing to a given object. So when an operation is performed like creating a a new object, the compiler can optimize that into a simple up, in, update in place. Um, this is great because aliasing errors now become immediate type errors in the linear type system. Um, so this uh, addition to Daphne is inspired by some prior verification work like Cogent uh, from 2016, also from uh, production languages like uh, Rust, which show that these you know, linear semantics are feasible for a lot of systems code. Um, however, even when it's not feasible, when linearity is too constraining, uh, we can still fall back to dynamic frames and theorem proving. 
So we can write code that will not be expressible in a strict linear type system. And we use this in some key places in our code base. Now I'll tell you a bit about the artifact itself. Very Better RKB comprises about 50,000 lines of Daphne code. Um, and it's compiled via a C++ backend that we added. Uh, it's proof to code ratio is about seven, which is comparable to our predecessor Ironfleet. Although the system is about three X's large. And so this shows that the um, methods do scale. Um, the TCB in total consists of uh, the environment model that I told you about earlier and also the application spec, uh, but also the you know, kernels API to access the disk, um, the Daphne verification toolchain, and of course the C++ compilation toolchain. Since we added this linear type system, we wanted to try to measure the developer productivity gains. Um, so we took two components in our code base that we convert to linear types and compare them before and after the conversion. Um, we found that there was a nice reduction in the code length by about 30%. Um, the verification time also dropped of individual methods. And you know, just subjectively speaking, we found that um, it was a lot more pleasant because um, the the linear type errors from the type system were now instant rather than requiring us to uh, wait for the verifier to finish and return an error. Now, of course, we did some uh, performance benchmarks using the YCSB benchmark suite for key value stores. For example, here we have the load phase from one of the benchmarks um, measuring the insert operations per second. Um, we compared both the dynamic frames version and the linear version of our code base. Um, and we you know, didn't really find any measurable difference, um, both achieving uh, over 5,000 operations per second for our benchmark. Um, we also compared to some state-of-the-art unverified uh, key value stores like Berkeley DB, which uses a B tree. Um, so very better KVs, B epsilon trees are supposed to be write optimized. So we found that it was faster as expected. Um, however, we also compared to RocksDB, which uses an LSM tree. It's one of the fastest um, key value stores out there. Uh, the LSM tree is another write optimized data structure, and so we're still lying behind them. Um, so uh, the B epsilon trees are pretty good on inserts as expected, but not um, still not the best. Um, we also um, lag behind both of them on queries um, for a few reasons. Uh, one is that uh, memory fragmentation results in a smaller effective cache size than would be ideal. Um, secondly, there are some uh, known optimizations that B epsilon trees need that uh, we're currently um, haven't implemented yet. So in conclusion, um, we found that the, the method of defining these templated system state machines to be a convenient and flexible way to encode environmental assumptions for system verification. Um, we found that the linear type system was practical for systems code, and also it relieved both developer and verified burden for the verified code. And finally, um, we found that you know very better KB is is advancing towards this towards the state of the art performance of non-verified systems, but with much stronger guarantees. Thank you.